Hey guys, it's the Jammering Podcast. This episode I got to sit down with Peter Schostead H, a philosopher. We got to talk about panpsychism and the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience. Check out his information in the description below and I hope you enjoy. The relationship between mind and matter is um, Schopenhauer called the world not. It's um, recently called, been called the hard problem of consciousness by uh, David Chalmers. Um, before that, the explanatory gap. And the problem is this, we don't really know how, you know, no matter the complexity of um, physiology, no matter the patterns and the synchronicities in the brain, um, and no matter the correlations we acquire, we still don't know how, um, why rather, those motion, ultimately those motions of matter um, cause or are identical to or relate in any way to um, mental states which cannot be cannot be um, described in spatial terms. So like for example, you can't you can't say that um, my satisfaction is uh, you know 30 centimeters wide or something like this or my curiosity is um, a certain shape. So, so this, is, this is um, some, more or less the emergence problem, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's yeah. another name for it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and that's one of the main problems with materialism, kind of this dominant theory of mind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if I give a little historical background then. So there's, well, generally there's <clears throat> three main notions, um, three main sort of ontologies, you know, um, worldviews that um, seek to explain that relation. And those are then materialism, as you say, mm -hmm. which is that the fundamental, the core fundamental aspect of reality is material um, matter or matter energy now um, which can be ultimately explained through space and time geometrically in other words um, opposed to that there's dualism which is the more co more commonly religious view so that's you know that um, there's two core fundamental aspects of reality that is matter then and on top of that the mind as the soul so René Descartes the French philosopher is mostly famous for um, positing that view but but also goes back immaterial to immaterial substance and the material substance. That's, That's right, yeah. And uh, sorry, and then there's a third view, which is idealism, which never really made it to Britain and uh, America so much, but it's much bigger in, on the continent, Germany especially. Um, so, well, it sort of made it to Ireland, I suppose, through Berkeley, but the most famous proponent of it is Immanuel Kant. And that's the view that um, the core, the core. Uh, essence of reality is only mind and matter is just a sort of illusion of minds very basically put yeah. the different forms of that and it's really um, easy to slip into solipsism from there right yep yeah, um it is i mean that's why i sort of moved away from schopenhauer schopenhauer sort of um was mostly influenced by kant here but and his main major work is called The World as Will and Representation. But there's this representationalism, which I've got a problem with, and that leads to solipsism, as you as you um, say. Yeah. Um, in fact, all of those positions have got major problems. And um, the sort of, since Descartes, really, I think what's generally happened in the West, you know, Descartes lived in the uh, 17th century. Um, we've adopted, we've sort of accepted Descartes' view um, that, that uh, ma that matter at least is geometrically describable and is without mind at all so that's separate from mind mm -hmm. um but we generally have you know we've got rid of the soul you know the mind so we're left with this dead matter that um descartes spoke of and now we're trying to well people are trying to figure out how from that dead matter you can get living uh, mentality as it were but that's reached a cul-de-sac, dead end, it seems, and that's then the you know explanatory gap or the hub from consciousness, or whatever you call it. It's an old problem. Leibniz's mill is the same thing, really. Mm. So that's why I'm looking at panpsychism, I should say, because that's a sort of fourth option in a way. So this is more or less the idea of um, a form of sentience sort of running all the way down, right? 
Yeah, that's right. So it's um, every every panpsychism, um, pan all and psychism, psyche, the mind. You know, everything is mind. All is mind. Um, so from you know humans to goats to mice to molecules, and to the subatomic, everything has an element of mind. Now there are different types of panpsychisms, and they all you know differentiate this a bit. But um, I sort of follow a more Whiteheadian form of panpsychism, uh, which is also known as pan experientialism, which says that, well, this is this is how it's different from, like, let's say, a dualism. It's not that um, matter and mind coexist at the fundamental levels of everything. It's rather that matter is an abstraction um, from the concrete, and that concrete already contains mind within it. But we just see the shell of the real, as it were. Just like when you see another person, you don't see his mind. You can infer it through his speaking and body language and so on, but you can't actually, you don't directly experience it. And so in some way, um, this thing has to be inferred of all matter, really. Yeah, everything. And so um, the way in which that deals with the uh, hard problem of consciousness is that there's no longer a problem of how mind has emerged from something that is non-mental, like matter, mm -hmm. um, which is a problem of emergence, uh, but because mind was there all along. Yeah, it's a nice so little side. The emergence side. is just one of complexity rather than an emergence of kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kind of at that level, they you make a separation between uh, different kinds of complexities. There's sort of the biological and just sort of the aggregate. Yeah, that's right. So, um, uh, yeah. say that again, sir. It's kind of uh, just different ways that they communicate with each other or the way that they bond together in order to uh, be a living thing or a, an aggregate? Yeah, I mean, this is this is actually, that's right. I mean, um, you know, Whitehead distinguishes aggregates um, from what we call societies, which are sort of um, um, collections that have a running that are, inter well, connections that are interconnected, I should say. So a lot, a common um, accusation against panpsychism is for example the claim that a chair that a chair is conscious is absurd and most modern panpsychists would not say that a chair as such is conscious mm -hmm. it's because the molecules that constitute a chair are not um are not particularly interrelated whereas the molecules within an organism um or you know like human but also a virus are interconnected and so that would determine then that the what we see as the uh, as the matter is a unit of subjectivity. But this is a very complex question, actually, one which I'm working on in my in my PhD now. Because there is um obviously the sentience that we're talking about at that sort of level is not the same as the consciousness we're experiencing as the full thing. No. Um, but it's, yes. it's like uh, an ingredient of. Yes, that's a very important point as well. That I. I, I try to point highlight because um, yeah, it's not either that molecules are conscious as we are, you know, with the sort of memories and uh, ambitions and so on, of course. Um, but um, let's see, I would argue that there's a, I use the word sentience. So there's a sort of basic feeling. It's not matter and it's not consciousness. If you define consciousness as a very complex form of feeling, which can imagine things which are not there and, and so on. Um, plan for the future but nonetheless a basic feeling perhaps akin to our subconscious something like this um, that is what lies within everything including ourselves but we've got the, the this complex form on top of it so are we then to sort of say that there's some kind of hierarchical consciousness throughout say a living organism say down to yeah yeah, like at, each, yeah. at each level there's more complex form of sentience yeah, you could say that. I mean, uh, there's a writer called Arthur Kostler who's written a book about that, Janus, um, and he calls these units within the hierarchy holons. And a holon is, has got two faces, you know, like Janus. And one looks, you know, outwards to the higher forms and one one downwards, as it were. So um, it's very, every holon is relational. Every holon exists in this hierarchy. And you find that in Leibniz as well in his monadology. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's not, it's not particularly new, but it's very, very tricky. Um, it's a very tricky thing to determine. Absolutely. And it's tricky to sort of, um, when you go right to the top, say we, we take ours, 
Uh, mm. There's this uh, nice coherence in our thoughts. Am I accurate in sort of describing that? And is that yes. is that that's not an emergence of some kind? Yes, as well as yeah, it's an emergence of complexity. Um, but it's the problem of emergence generally is that of um, you know mind coming out of matter, that which is not spatially describable coming out of that which is. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, it, it is a form of emergence. Yes, yes, you're quite right. Yeah. So. At what level in this hierarchy would we, or I know this is, I'm, I'm trying to dive in and see where this comes from, because I know with Leibniz, uh, he kind of said goodbye to free will. Where is panpsychism on free will? Um, well, it, it sort of depends on which type of panpsychism you take. Uh, for example, Karl, have you heard of Karl Popper, philosopher of science? He, um, he said that Schopenhauer was a Kantian turned panpsychist. And Schopenhauer is quite famous for not believing in free will. Um, in fact, Einstein famously quoted Schopenhauer, you know, saying that he agreed with Schopenhauer's view that there's no free will, therefore he doesn't blame people. <laughs> you know, it feels better that way. So that form of panpsychism, if you call Schopenhauer a panpsychist, that um, uh, needn't have free will. However, um, Whitehead's form does allow for free will. And... This is all part of free will really is an aspect of a broader term, mental causation. Um, how can the mental have any causal effect upon what we call the physical? Exactly. And in, White, in Whitehead, it, there's a good explanation because every, you know, in, in physics, um, f there are four fundamental forces. Well, some people dispute whether gravity is a force, but generally it's for traditional forces of nature are, you know, gravity, then um, uh, the electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force. Yep. And with, with those forces, you know, you can determine many things. You can create technology, predict the future and so on. Mm -hmm. But but then, you know, as the, the problem with mental causation is, well, what the, does that mean that the mind cannot cause anything to happen? Um, if you believe that, um, you become a an epiphenomenalist. So you think that the mind is a sort of after effect of matter. So it's emerged from matter somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Huxley, he came up with some epiphenomenalism. Um, it's like um, the steam coming out of a steam train. You know, it's uh, just, it, it's there, but it serves no purpose whatsoever. And it's kind of uh, just, uh, just it's, a feeling of free will, but it's not really there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's not, and I mean, not just free will, but, you know, if, for example, if you, um, the belief, you know, if you, uh, sit down and you read some math mathematics or logic or philosophy or whatever it may be and you sort of really strive to work work this out you know in your own way and uh, then you write something about it i mean you know that would be denied by the epiphenomenalist that you know that working out would have absolutely no effect could have no effect upon the movements of your body um which seems counterintuitive to say the least and it does run into certain paradoxes as well um so most emergentists, so that's their materialists, ultimately, who believe that the mind emerges out of matter, they want to maintain mental causation in that sense, um, free will. But they're, but they, that's why emergent, another reason, actually, why emergentism is a very unstable position today, even though it's the sort of the, the main standard viewpoint, at least in their sort of uh, general philosophic, psychological and scientific world and uh, Jay Won Kim a great uh, philosopher of mind Korean American he says that this emergentism has been the dominant philosophy since the 1970s but the problem is this mental causation they want to they they don't want to deny mental causation but at the same time they can't allow for it so there's a sort of uh, there's this paradox at the heart of the general world view uh, and one which whitehead's Whitehead's form of panpsychism, not sure now, but Whitehead's um, um, can overcome if you accept Whitehead's system, because what we call the forces of nature um, are only abstractions of the concrete reality, which is that um, every emotion ultimately has its then its sentient aspect, and so every force, as it were, 
ha is already more mental causation but we don't under we don't see that mental causation just as we don't see the mentality of other people as we said um we just see as it were the shell of those forces so mental causation is within everything and um and then that overcomes this problem of um you know epiphenomenalism versus mental causation because the ultimate point is that matter is not a real thing. Matter is only an abstraction of something much larger, which includes mentality at its heart. Yeah, absolutely. So there is no problem with there being any kind of free act at one level, considering that there was almost this kind of mentality of it always being free acts that are all forces anyway. Is that correct? Um, yeah, more or less. But I'd add this qualification that, of course, we are very much determined as well by our external um, environment and uh, the tradition which we are a legacy of. So, of course, yeah, you know, there is a degree of freedom um, that we have. But, of course, we're very much determined by, you know, our our society, our genes, um, our, the epigenetics have a factor in us and um, a number of other things. So although although freedom now, mental causation is possible. We shouldn't therefore believe that you know everything we do is freely chosen, as it were. Yeah. So there's sort of there's sort of an important mix there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that at least feels more true than denying one or the other. Mm, yeah. So you you mentioned but, before um, some of the biggest problems that was you're being faced that you're you're dealing with now in your PhD. Would you like to talk about them? Um. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, <laughs> it's one of my main problems that I'm working on, so I can't give you an answer to it, but it's, yeah, it's, um, how we determine what, if we say that subjectivity is inherent within everything in nature, um, the, the problem is how do we determine those units that encapsulate one subjectivity or one perspective upon the universe? Uh, this is quite tricky. For example, you know, like, um, you know how what determines the degree of connection of something to make it a single perspective and uh yeah like a, a mechanism that takes small into the large and binds yeah. it somehow yeah so um for example um why why would an amoeba how you know when me, amoeba cells come together they create a slime mold uh, would we say that the slime mold as such has one subjectivity or would we rather say it's more analogous to a city you know with a number of different subjectivities that work together yeah you know when you see a slime mold you know they're very amazingly clever organisms um, that can work out mazes and so on mm. um, which is interesting for a number of other reasons for example it shows that one needn't have a brain um, for in, you know a form of intelligence and one needn't have a brain for memory even mm. that's a side point but yeah so questions like this how would we be able to determine whether you know slime mold has one subjectivity or not so i'm working on this i don't have a proper answer yet but like i say Kosler writes about it whitehead does um so i'm trying to sort of fuse a, a few thinkers there yeah because uh, it was one of the things i was thinking about uh when trying to put this piece together and it, uh, when we talk about those kinds of freedoms or any kind of free action where we can exercise some kind of freedom, albeit a limited one, uh, at what sort of level in the hierarchy does that enter? Because we, we see little evidence of it at, at many levels below what we experience. We can almost even argue it for dogs or, and things like that. We don't really know about free acts within mm -hmm. a, a constrained environment, albeit, you know? Yeah. And of course, you know, we determine things by the general behavior of, of them. So, you know, we can determine the action of uh, atoms and molecules according to what they've done before. Um, but of course, that's, statistic that's a statistical prediction. So we wouldn't be able to predict one atom, you know, as part of Heisenberg's uncertainty principles as well. Um, of course, if you look at human beings, you know, you think yourself, most people have this intuition that they're free to a certain extent. Not everyone, but most people do. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to look at human beings from a transcendent point of view, so let's say looking down at a city at a different speed, so it's sort of, um, you know, fast forward, whatever, you would see humans, you know, like um, moving, especially along the motorways or the roads, whatever, um, in very 
predictable fashions that you could start making laws about, right? And then if you were some huge organism, imagine looking down into planet Earth with a microscope and you saw all these very common activities, you'd start making laws and, and producing a science out of it. Now, that doesn't, of course, mean that just because it's predictable, there's no freedom there. But like I say, um, m most things are mostly determined by their past and surroundings. Yep. And it seems like there may be just more and more limited freedom as you go down that hierarchy. Yeah, I think so. And I think, um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Bergson, Henri Bergson, the French philosopher, speaks about this. So, And to a certain extent, Nietzsche as well. So um, our evolution is in terms of uh, freedom. So we, we uh, evolve, you know, greater means of perception with, you know, five senses, further proprioception and so on. And then now with technology, so we can see infrared, ultraviolet and whatnot. Um, this gives us more uh, control over the environment, you know, is what part of what Nietzsche might call the will to power. Yep. Um, so we just have more input, you know, we can just perceive more of that around us, you know, to the distant, you know, with telescopes now, distant parts of the universe. So that gives us more freedom in the sense that we just know we can just um, calculate and uh, manipulate our environment better. And so I see, you know, evolution ultimately will go further in that respect. We'll just get better and better forms of perception. And in in a lot of respect, this is a, a phenomenological approach to trying to fit in the aspects of consciousness that you can describe into um, a kind of working theory for everything. Um, mm. And you are getting into a kind of psychedelic phenomenology. Yeah, it's um, it's a new field, <laughs> to say the least. But it's um, something I got into because I was I went in London. I was teaching philosophy of religion and. Uh, and uh, one of the arguments I had to sort of go through was this um, argument from experience, religious experience. I, I didn't know much about it at the time. I was I was roped into teaching theology. I mean, that's not my background. But uh, anyway, I did the studies and I got into that. And then I um, and then I realized, you know, re reading William James and others, Huxley and so on, I realized that the psychedelic experience, a uh, number of people have equated with the mystical experience. And um and and uh, then yeah no and then I found some uh, psilocybin mushrooms in my home village in Cornwall UK, and I tried them eventually and uh, and it's sort of you know just uh, it's hard not to go into cliches now but you know it's, it's sort of a sublime awe inspiring experience. Well, that's that's exactly uh, why we need phenomenology down in that realm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what's desperately needed is a psychedelic phenomenology, as as, as you as you say, and. Um, and, uh, you know, something I'm, I'm working on, but, um, there is, there is a sort of phenomenology from a guy called, I think it's, is it Bannon or Shannon? I guess, not Bannon, no, Shannon. Yeah. Um, he, uh, it was a sort of sociological study, um, where he used questionnaires about, you know, what did you experience, you know, like, uh, how transcendent was this experience from what level one to 10? Um, that's, the sort of quantitative approach to that phenomenology, I think it's useful, but it's, I think uh, with phenomenology, you, you need to rely on introspection almost by definition. And um, applying phenomenology as we find it in, um, you know, Husserl, Heidegger, and so on, Merleau-Ponty, applying that kind of analysis to the incredible forms of, and multifaceted forms of consciousness one gets under psychedelic uh, uh, experience is is a fascinating field. It hasn't been touched upon. Now, just to, just to sort of get a bit of a background on phenomenology a little bit more, just in case people are completely new to this, um, yeah. it's kind of a, a, a novel kind of science, you'd say, right? Where it's trying to strip back and try, almost catch consciousness in its act of how it's doing whatever it's doing. Is that right? Yeah, sort of. It's like a taxonomy, a classificationary scheme of uh, the different states of mind one has. So, you know, one can talk about, for example, level of wakefulness. One can talk about the intensity of an experience, the complexity or simplicity of it, the emotive aspects, the perceptual aspects, and that can be ramified down into sound, uh, vision, and so on. Um, 
Brentano speaks about intentionality, for example, which means that thoughts are often about something which matter is not. So there's another distinction between mind and matter and understanding of it. So, yeah, it's a sort of... Um, Just on, the, on that sort of topic, that's, uh, again, going along these other lines where you can reveal uh, some of the mechanisms of consciousness, such as uh, duration, um, towardedness, like you were saying with intentionality. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Applying that to the psychedelic world, have you, have you found anything? <clears throat> well, I, I, in that respect, no, but I've um, found a number of other things. Um, well, actually, you know, one thing you mentioned, the duration. So I found that, um, interestingly, I wrote about this in my book, uh, Numenautics. Um, for example, I saw my, I moved my hand in front of my eyes, and it sort of left this trail behind it. And so one, I speculated from a Bergsonian point of view that it might be the the sort of um, duration of what we generally call the present was extended. So that movement was in sort of one mo one present moment, for example. Um, another interesting thing in terms of phenomenal phenomenology, I mean, one of, the, one of the biggest aspects of phenomenology is the notion of the self. What is the self? Is it an illusion? And so on. And um, I found one... Once I found my so-called self being uh, shattered into about five or six different forms. And so I couldn't, <laughs> it's a very strange experience where I couldn't identify, you know, any particular identity as mine uh, in the normal sense. So that, you know, one can do a lot of research into that in respect to notions of the self through introspection, for example. Like true hallucinations with the, the Dennis and Terence McKenna team. They describe very similar things. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, true hallucinations. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they they they've done a lot of groundwork in in this respect. And um, Terence McKenna used Whitehead actually a lot. Um, he said Whitehead was the philosopher for the psychedelic experience. Um, so that's partly why I'm well. I, I'm using Whitehead for for that analysis. I mean, I wrote um, an article recently came out in the psychedelic press. It's online for free now. Um, called "The Great God Pan Is Not Dead." Alfred North Whitehead and the psychedelic mode of perception, where I apply Whitehead's general cosmology to the psychedelic experience. Um, another aspect which I haven't even touched upon yet is the notion of eternal ideas in Whitehead, which is akin to Plato's forms or Russell's universals, um, and how that relates to the psychedelic experience, possibly. I mean, most of this work is all very conjectural at this moment. You know, there's hardly any literature on it. Or, uh, there's hardly any literature on it. There's some. Uh, but not much, and so you sort of have to do the field work yourself. Mm. And it seems that there's a history of psychedelics in philosophy. It it, it yes. seems to go right the way back. There's always this essence of um, mystical uh, encounters and trip reports, basically, mm -hmm. throughout history. Um, yeah, it's I strange mean, that it hasn't yeah. had as much groundwork sort of set behind it from a phenomenological standpoint recently, especially if there's everyone seems to jump straight to... Um, learning ethics or something from when they have these trips they come back with a, a love everybody a new ethic rather than trying to figure out what that really means for consciousness yeah yeah i mean that's that's what i i find lacking so i mean you know the, the politics of it and the ethics of it is interesting but it's uh it's not the main thing you know the main thing is the unbelievable experience one has and i think that yeah you have to use really the more like you know go into the tools within metaphysics or philosophy of mind or th a part of which is phenomenology uh, this is where the real the, the sort of uh, treasures lie i think yeah um but that's uh, you know um it's not easy i mean it's such a confusing experience in the first place and so overwhelming um it well, i mean one when one is under the influence i don't think one can really do philosophy in that analytic sense but afterwards, if one retains the memory, then certainly, yeah. But the funny, although there's a psychedelic history of philosophy, I have an article on it, um, on high existence, I'll start with Plato. Although that's there, philosophy of mind as such really got into its own only in the last hundred years. And um, when psychedelics came on the scene in the 60s, the general philosophy of mind view was very reductivist, by which I mean um, consci that consciousness was generally seen as an illusion or that it could be reduced to something like behavior and behaviorism or um, 
uh, the identity theory, which is that, you know, phenomenal states simply were um, brain states, which people don't really believe in. Many people don't believe in anymore because of multiple realization problems. And um, mm. logical positivism, functionalism, um, even eliminativism and the view that, you know, that consciousness doesn't even exist. Um, yep. So... So that's what I think that's why there's little literature on it, because it just it unfortunately coincided with that sort of bleak time within the philosophy of mind. And uh, now the interesting thing now is that there's this sort, sort of psych psychedelic renaissance happening. And that's ha that's coinciding with uh, very exciting uh, new theories in, in the philosophy of mind. So that's why I think in 10, 20 years, there'll, there'll be a lot of interesting uh, stuff to read. Yeah, absolutely. Now. How does this fit in with panpsychism? If we sort of take this uh, idea of uh, these small sentience levels getting together in a hierarchy and eventually you have this complex form of consciousness that we experience, what is mm. it doing when it has a psychedelic experience? What's What's been added to it? Is there is there anything that's in panpsychism to sort of explain it? Well, I mean, that's, you know, I can only uh, conjecture about that, but okay, I, I will. So, for example, I said I, I experienced... The shattering of the self. Yeah. Um, and one thing that psychedelics might do, I mean, the neuroscience here is very young as well. Um, so nothing is sh nothing is certain here. But um, one thing one presumes that psychedelic chemicals do is they break down the normal functioning of the brain. Uh, they stop general um, um, connections and and so on synchronicities. So as a result. Um, that unified form of consciousness, which we call the self, conceivably does break down. And then where does one find oneself? Well, then these subjectivities within the human organism might break down into several parts. And, you know, if you believe that is in panpsychism, that these parts already have their own sort of mentality. So it could be, you know, one relationship between panpsychism and psychedelic um, consciousness is that it could be that we are our units, our holons, our units of subjectivity are breaking down into smaller ones that we then experience. And that's partly why they're so alien. Um, that's that's one possibility. I'm not saying I believe that, but, um, you know, it's a, something worth looking into. Another one is um, I wrote about in this article was, um, you know, if you believe, for example, that plants have a form of subjectivity, and that's actually less and less controversial point of view um, these days. Yep. Um, but let's assume that they do. Now, uh, there's a number of uh, trip reports which talk about um, a kind of the, the purported fusion of one's consciousness into that of the plant. Uh, this is more radical, but if you accept the Whiteheadian cosmology again, um, all, conscious all consciousness, really, all perception is the taking in of the external within oneself and that includes the consciousness from without so psychedelic experience again could block could um stop the limiting effect of the brain upon one's own organism and allow for this what white end calls vectorization into other organisms uh you know quite a radical claim but um it is. It is. So uh, it kind of kind of allows for radical. entering into different worlds, essentially. Yeah, essentially. I mean, although it's radical, you have to understand people. I think most people don't understand that we are at such a dead end with the mind matter problem that whatever the solution is, whatever way there is to get out of this, it's going to be radical. And so what's sort of bothering people at the moment, I guess, because obviously having materialism as being the, the dominant sort of a dogma really in, in society at the moment and it's kind of always got that promise of eventually we'll figure this one out we figured out so much yeah. already eventually we'll figure this one out so everyone's kind of just you know left it all behind realizing that it's probably unsolvable given their foundation and if we get into this other realm and we can actually talk about those sorts of experiences as being more real than just the normal uh brain misfirings that they normally try to sell us on right right yeah i mean there's a name for that um it's called promissory materialism you know it's well we can't work this out yet but you know just just uh stick with us and we'll work it out but i mean the it's just logically 
there's there's not only no solution on the horizon. The, the problem really is that we wouldn't even know what a solution would look like. Yes. It certainly wouldn't look like any other scientific explanation of reduction, because that's always in terms of um, what is ultimately spatially describable to something else that is spatio describable, usually on a micro scale. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit like the um, perihelion of Mercury. Um, it didn't really, Newton's physics couldn't really explain it, but people believed because they believed that Newton had discovered the, the ultimate laws of nature. They think, well, we ha can't work that out now, but you know, eventually we'll work it out. But then of course it never happened. And you had the paradigm shift with Einstein uh, who, who could explain that. But then of course his theory doesn't explain, doesn't cohere with quantum physics. And even if that was overcome, those two combined seemingly would not explain consciousness. So we're not, we're, we're nowhere near a solution to this. And not to say that there can't be a solution. I mean, some Colin McGinn, for example, he's he he's a mis, so-called mysterion because he argues that we humans cannot will not be able to find a solution to this mind matter problem. Um, so we're talking radical stuff now, which uh, probably in my lifetime won't won't have a definitive solution at all. But, but I've, got uh, I've got to chip away at it. The, the, say that again. We got to chip away at these things, though. They're still got to be out there. No, we'll well, talk about them. <laughs> Well, I think the interest, you know, what's interesting is that that which we don't know. So um, that's what makes all of this, not only the philosophy of mind in terms of panpsychism, but also psychedelic experience. It makes it fascinating because there's just no one really can explain it. Absolutely. Um, some of the, I've been talking to some people about these different theories of mind and you sort of find yourself looking at, say, dualism, for instance. Uh, it's obviously got where almost every religion in the world sort of is is lying uh, mm. they draw a morality from mm. from this this world is that possible within panpsychism have you stumbled across any way to find a kind of morality a kind of ethic a way to act something that we can find good bad that we can have value jud judgments in there and they actually mean something is there any kind of ethic in there um, there is, but um, I mean, ethics, I tend towards a meta ethics of, um, of, of, of extreme skepticism. But I think that you can derive, I mean, the interesting thing is this, that if, I mean, on a very basic level, it, if panpsychism were accepted, it would have immediate repercussions upon vegetarianism, veganism, for example, mm -hmm. because, it's, you know, if, if these are sent, if plants are sentient beings, then, you know, even you're, you're, you're sort of damaging them and harming them, even if you're not eating animals. Um, of course, when that's put to vegetarians, they, they will normal, normally say, well, they probably can't suffer as much as animals. But I mean, how, how do you how, how do you prove that really? All animals, including fleas and so on? Mm. It's, you know, that's an interesting one. Um, Switzerland recently have given right, I don't remember the details, but recently, a few years ago, I think they... They gave certain rights to plants as sentient beings. So that has immediate ethical repercussions. Um, also, it means that if it were true, from a Whiteheadian point of view, again, it would mean that values are a core component of the es essential reality. They're not something that emerge out of complex brains. Yeah, in the same way consciousness um, is, yeah. Yeah, so, really. so, so for, for Whitehead, um, perception is valuation. Uh, it's also the case for Bergson on Nietzsche even. Um, so, you know, you perceive that which is potentially valuable to you. And of course, we evolve to exclude uh, the perception of those things which have no value to us. So, for example, we can't uh, naturally perceive um, infrared because it hasn't been particularly useful for us to do so. We we can create technology now, of course, that can convert infrared into the spectrum that we can see. Yeah. And it, because it is it has become useful to us now. Um, so we've had this artificial evolution in that sense. But generally, um, most of reality is we are completely blind to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, so it doesn't really say there's an objective, a good or bad to be found here. But it's this constant process of where we're being inbuilt in our everyday sort of movements and judgments anyway, correct? Um, yeah, so um, so everything, 
around us is valuating constantly. Um, but the real, ma the ethical question is really, what, what degree of value do we give those al other valuations that are occurring around us? Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally, like I say, I'm skeptical. I'm ethically skeptical, so I don't think there can be a definite, definitive answer to this, you know. Um, but just like, you know, Descartes, for example, in, in his dualism, he didn't allow for animals to have souls, you know. So they were like matter; they were sort of dead zombies, as it were. Even his, even pet dogs, whatever, and cats. Um, if you think about animals like that, of course, you will treat them uh, in a less respectful manner, generally speaking. Um, if we conferred then sentience to animals, as I think most people accept, you know, we give them, we we uh, we respect them in terms of um, ethics, general ethics, uh, more utilitarianism especially. Um, so if we were to also give those to plants, then that I think that would change our, our, our modes of life considerably. And of course, you know, this has a number of um, implications for the ecological movement as well, you know, the respect for the world and nature. Absolutely. But this is a field I'm not really looking into, but I think it's a fascinating field. I mean, I'm sure that some things have been written about it and there's much more to come. The relationship between panpsychism and ecology. Yeah, it's because it's it's obviously got like the all the way up sort of vibe as well, where you know there could be a sentience above us, the, a, a Gaia sort of thing. It's hinting yeah. towards things like that. <laughs> Don't know if I like it. Yeah. Well, you know, interesting because the Gaia theory comes from Lovelock, and uh, but you find exactly the same theory in a guy called Gustav Fechner, who lived about 200 years ago, um, and uh, he was a panpsychist, uh, quite a well-known one, um, also the uh, founder of uh, psychophysics, yeah, um, a sort of scientist philosopher, and um, anyway, he argued that that you know we have this we're talking about hierarchy of of levels of consciousness, yeah, but where whereas I would be tempted to stop at the human. He goes further and talks about human societies, about planets, suns, stars, and so on. You know, he didn't know about the, you know, clusters of galaxies and galaxies in his day, but that would be the implication until finally you arrive at the sort of over sentience, and that is what he he called God. Yep. But then there's there's the there's a transition from panpsychism into pantheism and and thus philosophy into theology. Yeah, which we, we don't need to go there and we don't need to go as far because you still can't really describe any kind of mechanism of how, say, something above a human is part yeah. of, or we are part of, we, we, it, it doesn't make any sense. There seems to be a breakdown of a, of a mechanism of... Yeah, of a, well, in, yeah, because in organisms you have the physical connections that you see at least uh, that can explain... The hierarchy but yeah above that you can't although yeah yeah so i haven't gone to that area yet i mean it's not not to say it's not an interesting area but it's um i mean you know it's very you know, it would be very speculative it'd be very hard to prove anything yeah it, it seems to be hard to prove a lot of those things that get a bit too woo <laughs> yeah so yeah. um are you still teaching at the moment um, not now, not in the third term. I, um, I taught, uh, lo elementary logic last term and before that analytic metaphysics and I, taught, I teach as well essay, essay writing skills. Um, and at the, my main, apart from my PhD, my main job at the moment is actually, uh, editing a book on stem cell research ethics. Oh, wow. Strangely, <laughs> uh, for, yes, for, um, for Routledge, Taylor and Francis. Know. It's just begun. Um, I think it will be published, should be published uh, sometime about about a year from now. Um, but it's an anthology, so a number of scientists and philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists are um, submitting their articles. And my job is really just to, they're not all from English, native English speakers. So uh, my job is to basically make the articles more readable. So I will suggest how they might change the structure a little bit of the composition, um, maybe linking sentences that sort of show the reader where they are, um, as well as sort of um, suggestions for style. Are you getting lost in the content, well. though, as you're going through it? Uh, excuse me? Is it interesting content? 
Yeah, no, it's fascinating, actually. I mean, I don't know much. I didn't know much about stem cell research ethics, uh, and except for what I read in the press, you know, it's a very interesting topic. But um, I've, it's just started. I mean, I've, I've done two essays, gone through two essays so far. But even that, it's fascinating. Yeah, I didn't, for example, a lot of the laws, um, it's, it, there's a disharmony in the European regulations for stem cell research uh, because of the fact that, say, certain drugs are illegal. Like there's one drug that they wanted to use for these stem cell trials, but it was illegal in Spain. So that meant that they couldn't use it in any of the other countries. There's also this other problem that um, a lot of the regulations created for research into stem cell ethics was based on the original um, uh, modus operandi, whereby you one would um, get stem cells from embryos or, or zygotes. Um, yeah. Whereas now you can get stem cell. One needn't get stem cells from from those. Uh, yeah, we got like the from embryos. Some bone marrow so, or placenta ones. Yeah, bo like that. Bone, bone marrow. Yeah, actually, I was reading one about bone marrow, for example. Quite right. So. So the funny thing is, um, uh, people who want to research, who use those bone marrow derived stem cells, uh, they still have to go through these hurdles designed uh, to um, to appease the uh, religious sensibilities from the older technology. So the sort of regulation hasn't is not in line with the latest technology, and it's causing a lot of uh, a lot of delays and, and so on. You know, it's a fascinating area. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. Have you noticed any? Um excitement on campus for when you do teach uh surrounding panpsychism have you been able to bring some more minds to the to the front here yeah well um, uh <laughs> i gave a talk on um uh, introducing panpsychism for about an hour to the exeter university philosophy society that's actually on youtube now you can see that there's another video as well on just the slides of that um so that that brought in a rather large crowd um i actually last year i had a panpsychism reading group um, brought in some undergraduate students, some postgrads as well. Um, I didn't have time to do that this year, but um, I might, I might do it again later. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think generally my, uh, it seems my main mission is just to sort of make people realise that panpsychism is not as crazy as they will immediately believe. Yeah, and in fact, it, it deals with a well, it, it takes care of a lot of the problems that you see with all the other sort of theories of mind mm. and. Something, something's been coming up. And now, Karnak is this character that's from the 65 or something. He was introduced as a Marvel character, right? And uh, the, yeah, the, the new writers that. somehow got hold of your work and starting to build it in. Is that right? Yeah, it's a strange one. Yeah, so I think in the 60s, Stan Lee and someone else created this Karnak character. He was like a martial artist, philosopher, superhero, uh, part of the Inhumans family. So he was never a major figure in himself mm -hmm. anyway marvel um marvel asked warren ellis uh, the great comic book writer who wrote like iron man 3 and james bond and so on um to recreate karnak as his own comic you know recreate the character and create this m series of comics for him so he did that and um he uh, he wrote in his newsletter he's big on on social media and so on he uh, wrote that this character was um based on the philosopher of Eugene Thacker, a philosopher in New York, and myself primarily, and others as well. So um, that gave him, and th that was primarily based on a chapter in my book called Neo-Nihilism, which is that ethical, skeptical position I was talking about. Um, so yeah, that had an effect on this sort of, uh, on this Marvel superhero character, strangely. I had never expected anything like that to happen, but there you go. Oh, it's, it's a strange way to embody an idea, but it's a pretty cool one. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, fast, it's it's interesting because in university now, um, a big new factor in with regard to the importance of researchers or staff is you know imp, so-called impact, right? So it used to be that the important thing was how many journals, uh, how many respectable journals y y you published in, and now it's that and funding. But on top of that, is, there's impact, which is how has your work to influence society? <laughs> so so this is um, an un unusual way to impact society, but it has a large reach. And now they're creating the Inhumans film, um, which will be a massive thing. So it's a, sort of a company. Marvel have teamed up with ABC and IMAX cinemas. So that's going to be a sort of mo two movies and a TV show. Yeah. Are they going to help you to work on it? <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> 
I'm getting my publicist at the moment to uh, get me the red carpet treatment for the premiere. But we'll see how that works out to start with. Okay. Oh, cool.